Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the Department of Medicine and I welcome you all to this CCR. Today, we are going to present a very unique, uh, very difficult, a very challenging case, uh, which we could uh, do because of the teamwork and the support from the other departments. So, uh, I, without wasting time, I request Dr. Swaras to take up the charge. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, good afternoon again. So, uh, welcome to today's clinical combined round, which is going to be presented by Department of Radiation Oncology in collaboration with Division of Pediatric Oncology, AIMS in Delhi. So, this is going to be the outline of today's combined clinical round. Total body radiation, as we all know, is an important component of conditioning regimens for allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in patients with high risk or relapsed ALL or AMS. The objectives of TBI are basically threefold. Number one is cytotoxicity, basically eradication of residual or persistent leukemic clones. It also creates space in the bone marrow for engraftment and it also leads to immunosuppression to prevent post projection of donor hematopoietic stem cells. So broadly speaking, TBI may be classified into myeloablative and immunoablative TBI. The myeloablative TBI uh, Regimen usually consists of 12 to 14.4 rays of TBI delivered in 6 to 8 fractions twice daily with minimum of 6 hour interfraction interval. In immunoablative TBI, we deliver 2 to 4 rays in 1 to 2 fractions, uh, mostly in relatively elderly patients with comorbidities who are, uh, who are undergoing non malleability chemotherapy or reduced intensity conditioning chemotherapy. Most centers worldwide, and in fact, more than 80% centers in continental Europe still practice conventional TBI using large fields and extended SST on a medical linear accelerator in a specially designed radiotherapy bunker. However, there is a recent surge of interest in conformal optimized TBI using helical tomotherapy or VMAT platforms due to optimal target coverage, reasonable dose homogeneity, sparing of critical organs at risk like lungs, kidneys, and limbs. It also provides increased patient comfort and convenience, and it leads to avoidance of patient-specific compensators, shielding blocks, specialized RT bunkers with extended SST treatment facilities, which might be quite cumbersome. In this CCR, we will highlight the use of BMAT-based myeloablative TBI as a part of conditioning regimen for allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplant in a five-year-old boy with relapsed BALN. With this, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Anish to present the clinical case summary. He has just joined our department a few months back. So, Dr. Anish, please. So, I am presenting the case of a two and a half year old boy with no significant past comorbidities. He had a history of liver malignancy in his pectoral gland. He was diagnosed with uh, PLL in May 2020. His baseline TLC was 33,100 with 54% atypical cells and a big dead count of 15,000. Bone marrow flow cytometry was subsequently performed, which was positive for CD45, 10, 19, and 22. PCR for cytogenetics was negative for translocation at 21, 822, 119, and MLL GPM. The child was then started. I still included this tailor protocol with the effect from 30th of May 2020. Post induction chemotherapy, child was in morphological clinch with the MRD being negative. He then completed the chemotherapy regimen on 8th of December 2020. Patient then presented after 32 months of disease free interval, that is, post two months of completion of chemotherapy with complaints of fever and diagnosis during the routine follow up on 23rd of February 2020. Subsequent investigations showed that the clinical count was 380 per millimeter cube with markedly cellular reference being assured 70 to 80 percent loss. Morphological features were consistent of relapse. Bone marrow flow cytometry was suggestive of pre BAN. Cytogenetic studies were then performed during relapse, which was suggestive of a complex cellular package. Fish were filled with a LM panel was also performed, which was negative for Jack 2. ABL1, ABL2, CRL2, NPD, CFR, beta DIN, and CSF cytology was negative for the Further treatment about uh, relapse will be shared by Dr. 
Good afternoon all. Uh, the child was diagnosed as a case of early isolated medical relapse outside and he was started on BFM risk protocol from outside. And he has already received three reinduction chemotherapy blocks prior to presenting to AIMS and unfortunately he was still MRD positive. So it was a challenging situation for us to determine a treatment strategy for such a heavily pre-treated early medullary relapse with a complex karyotype. So we revisited all his clinical and treatment records, reviewed the literature and discussed multiple times in our unit at length to decide upon the treatment strategy further. And we conquered that he is an ideal candidate for immunotherapy followed by an hematopoietic stem cell transplant. In the case of relapsed PLL, the immunotherapy would be a winner to map. But in order to pursue that, we had to overcome many uh, challenges. The first one was the procurement of the drug itself. Uh, the drug is not readily or uh, easily available in India. We have to import this drug from the outside. It is basically a monoclonal antibody and it is being uh, produced outside India only. And the, another limiting factor for him was the uh, sky high cost of the drug. The, each vial of the drug containing a minuscule amount of 38.5 microgram of glina cost around 86,000. And for a one cycle of uh, immunotherapy for this child, we would be needing at least 7 to 8 vials that would further add to the cost of the uh, treatment for this child. Uh, the third, another challenge for us was like here in our division and also in AIMS, we were using this drug for the first time. So we really have to educate ourselves first how to do that, then also to our colleagues, staff, nurses and all, how to basically prepare this drug, store this, when and how to administer it, but all precautions we need to take so as to avoid any undue complications which may arise because of any inadvertent mistake which may commit by uh, administration of this drug. So to buy time by, for sorting out all these logistic issues, we decide to continue this child on one more cycle of chemotherapy. And he received one more uh, argon block here and post that he turned out to be MRD negative. Then again we were in dilemma what to do now. So we revisited, look for the evidence again. And we learned that the ch children who have been transplanted after a cycle of immunotherapy fared better in terms of an overall survival and a relapse-free survival. So we decided to concur to our previous decided plan and to pursue with the winner to map. Uh, so he received his first cycle of winner to map in the mid of June and July. And he was MRD negative. Just for the interest of the audience here, I would like to say a few words about Vinatubab. As I told earlier, it is a monoclonal CD19 antibody. It's a basically by a specific T cell enclosure, as we can see here in the diagram. It contains two receptors. The one is CD19, which binds to the uh, tumor cells which express CD19, as we all know in case of a BLL. And the second receptor is CD3. It binds to the T cells. So what it does? Simultaneously, it will bind both the cells and bring the tumor cells close to the T cells so that they can lie these cells by their effective function, thereby decreasing the tumor burden. So, this is how it works, and it's really important how we administer it. So, it is available in the form of a white diaphragmatic powder along with the diluent, which is available along with the insert uh, with the pack, tetra pack of the drug. And this drug has to be prepared under a laminar flow, taking all accepted precautions. We have to be really cautious, no spilling, no the loss of this dilute. So it's very costly drug. If we manhandle this drug, then it would be we would land up in a big problem because it would cost around three lakh for a person who is arranging this drug. And uh, another thing is how to store it. But all uh, we need a special bags like if we can appreciate in this. Uh, picture these are special polyethylene like in three bags, this tubing which we need, we, uh, all these things logistically arranged and sorted out previously prior starting this cycle to this cycle. And the, another important thing is like it is a six week cycle. Each cycle is of six weeks duration and he needs four weeks of continuous inpatient monitoring. That is the child has to be admitted for at least a month in a hospital setting. And the infusion is like an uninterrupted continuous infusion. There should be no bubble in this tubing. And we have to take utmost precautions by changing these bags. So we are really thankful to our staff who have helped us in carrying out this, uh, all this uh, uh, eventfully. 
So fortunately, our child tolerated this cycle very well, and at the end of this, he was MRD negative. So I stated earlier the plan was to like uh, administer. Uh, so we have a plan was to uh, start uh, to uh, start him on immunotherapy and then MRD negativity and consolidate him with a haploparenchymal transplant. So simultaneously we carried out his pre-transplant worker and he was the only single child of his parent and there was no matched sibling donor available at the predefined transplant timeline which we uh, diagnosed for this patient. So we, after discussing with the family, we decided to proceed ahead with a hypoidentical transplant uh, with his father who has a 6 by 12 match uh, with his son. So as a part of the conditioning regimen, we decided to run a mild organic conditioning using the TBI and we referred this child for the pre tbi worker for her to our radiation oncology team. Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Anish to discuss the case further. Uh, so, before taking up TBI, we do a pre TBI examination which includes uh, performance uh, scale. He had uh, landscape layer 90 with no bigger interest, clubbing, cyanosis, or edema. On uh, hematopoietic lymphatic system examination, he had no normal oral cavity, no palpable lymph nodes or sternal tenderness. His bilateral testes were descended with no abnormal swelling. Hepatomegaly was noted in his child, which was 1.5 centimeters below post margin. So regular margin was not tender and CBS investment examinations were within normal limits. For pre-TBI evaluation, a complete physical examination has to be performed following which CBC count LFT and KFT was done, which is within normal limits. And total general clearance was obtained from CDR and to be echocardiography uh, has to be done. This was a normal study with ejection fraction of 60% in this time. PFT was of is also needed, which was with the normal limits, and a DTPS scan to look for a global GFR, which was 120 ml per minute for 1.73 meters square body surface. PVI MRD status has to be confirmed, which was negative in this child. Subsequent information about PVI can be negative in this child. So, uh, when we take a patient for TBI, uh, we have to ensure the complete. Uh, so for this patient, we had immobilized this patient in supine uh, with hands by side and neck in neutral position. We had used a uh, thermoplastic head mask, uh, uh, uniframe, and a blue bag was made for the patient, which uh, which we can mold according to patient's contour. And laser was used to ensure the proper alignment of the patient and skin marking were put so that we can replicate the position during our uh, treatment uh, execution. So uh, then we have uh, taken a CT of the patient, a non contrast CT was taken and uh, with a slight sickness of 5 mm. Initially patient was uh, scanned in head first supine position, uh, almost 2 cm above the vertex to mid thigh and then uh, uh, this image is showing uh, the head first uh, CT. So, and then uh, patient was again scanned in uh, by rotating 180 degree and uh, in feet first supine, 2 cm below uh, toes to most uh, of pelvic inlet, and we ensured uh, that there was more than or equal to at least 10 cm of overlap. Then, uh, in our planning uh, system, we had uh, used both the CT uh, uh, data sets. Uh, here we can see. Uh, So uh, this is the fuse area and we can see it is properly filled. Uh, for target and OR, OR voluming, uh, as we know it is total body that we are targeting. We had uh, two data set. We had made up PTV in upper, uh, PTV upper hemi body in head first uh, supine data set and PTV lower hemi body in feet first, uh, data, feet first supine data set and it was cropped 2 mm from the skin. and oh, all the OERs like bilateral eyes, lens, lungs, heart, kidney and liver were made in head first supine data set. So here we can see we had made the um, patient body in head first supine uh, data set and we had controlled all the essential OERs and we had given a uh, PTV margin by cropping uh, them from the skin. 
similarly in uh, fit for supine position also we had contoured the patient and we had given a ptv margin then we had done a uh, we had given a dose precision of 12 grade six fraction over three days two fraction per day at the interval of six hours to ptv upper hemi body and lower hemi body we had given a target dose specification um, and uh, we wanted the uh, ptv dose respect uh, 95 percent of ptv volume should be more than or equal to 95 percent that is 1.4 grade uh, we tried to avoid hot spot so uh, those volume of ptv receiving 107 percent should be less than 10 percent and similarly we had given a uh, oir dose constraint and then we had given uh, this for plan the dhanwadan sir will explain about the plan Good afternoon. Um, volumetric modulator R therapy delivers. Uh, it is an advanced radiation therapy de treatment delivery technique. It delivers the continuously shaped beams of radiation by continuous rotation around the patient with optimized dose rate and the Gandhi rotation speed. Limitations of linear, uh, as far as the beam at TBA is concerned, is the maximum dimension that can be treated by a single isocentric field. Uh, it is depends on the maximum field size of the linear, which is 40 centimeter. So with the use of multiple isocenter also, we can able to treat uh, in a single plan, we can able to treat uh, the patient height of 105 centimeter only, which, which is limited by the couch longitudinal movement range, which is 65 centimeter. So for this patient, we need two VMAT plans. One is for a head first, one is for upper body, which is head first supine plan, and another one is for lower body, uh, which is feet first supine plan. For smooth transition of doses from one isocenter to another isocenter, as well as one plan to another plan, we need at least uh, few regions of uh, overlap, few region of overlap, so that that uh, short and cold one inch in between the junction region will be reduced, as well as it will reduce the dosimetric error which may occur due to patient setup errors. For this patient, we have implied five centimeter overlap region in the thigh re in thigh region. Head first supine plan consists of two isocenters. Each isocenter has uh, two single arc fields. So total segments, that is uh, total number of um, MLC shaped beams are 608 with the total monitor units of 3749. This plan serves as a base plan for the fit first spine plan, which will take into consideration of this distribution and try to achieve uniform distribution in the lower body also. So fit first spine plan consists of two ICO centers, uh, each having uh, two, each having one dual arc field with the 20 centimeter overlap between the adjacent isocenter fields. The feed first supine plan consists of 324 segments and with the total monitor units of 1283. So this is the bias plan, this is the feed first supine isocenter fields. So as, as mentioned earlier, head first supine will treat the upper body, feed first supine will treat the lower body. Together they produce uniform, uh, acceptable uniform dose to the whole body of the patient as well as uh, OIR sparing such as lungs. I can even touch that. So after the plan is made, uh, we'll take, uh, we'll see uh, the beam parameters and uh, we'll evaluate accordingly. So here are the beam uh, parameters being planned. I'll explain it in subsequent size. So this was the first size center that was put between uh, head and thorax. Uh, this slide is showing do dose color wash uh, at the the head and thorax level in uh, axial uh, coronary and uh, sagittal section with uh, dose volume histogram. Uh, similarly, uh, another ISO center was at the level of thorax and uh, pelvic region. Uh, then for feet first supine, uh, one ISO center was at the level of knee and then uh, another ISO center was at the level of uh, ankle joint. And, uh, here we can see the combined uh, feet first supine plus head, uh, first point plan in head first point position. Uh, the total plan and total dose distribution in color wash can be seen in all the three pages and uh, this volume is total uh, dose coverage. Also similarly in uh, the same data set in uh, fit first point position. Then we'll, uh, we had uh, evaluated the uh, dose statistics. So here we can see uh, that we have achieved almost all the uh, ta target dose volume specification. Also for OARs like lung and uh, both the lungs, we had achieved a D mean of less than uh, 10 grade. And for uh, 
bilateral kidneys also uh, we had achieved mean dose of less than 10 gray and for lens also we had uh, achieved our dose function so apart from uh, routine mission quality assurance patient specific qa is the most uh, is one of the important and the mandatory procedure to ensure the accuracy of imac delivery especially in the cases of compli complicated plans like uh, tba imac this is the essential step to detect potential error result from an inaccurate dose calculation a failure in record and verify system or delivery errors in the linac which may lead to the uh, which may affect the treatment outcome as well as radiation safety of the patient is concerned so in this in this procedure the exact uh, patient vmat plan fluences will be uh, in, will be assigned to the phantoms with the 2d array which is having 1220 vented ionization chambers uh, and this measured fluence will be compared with the calculated one using gamma analysis method as per the american association of physicians in medicine uh, taking uh, task group 2 on it they recommended that gamma analysis result should be more than 95 percentage for the gamma criteria of 2 mm uh, 3 percentage with the 10 percentage threshold so this is the gamma analysis window of hepatic uh, spine plan head and neck iso center as you can uh, see that the calculated and measured influence are uh, resembles the coronal section distribution of the patient plan at iso center level this is the individual field uh, gamma analysis result uh, average passing rate for the head first spine plan is 96.5 percentage and average passing rate uh, for the feet first spine plan is uh, 98.3 percentage which is more than the recommended 95 percentage value so once the patient specific QA is passed that is we are we are sure that what we have planned uh, we are achieving then uh, we will take up the patient for setup we will set the patient at the uh, planned CT ISO center and then we will uh, according to the shift we will shift the patient to treatment ISO center and we will ensure that uh, all the alignments and uh, planned uh, positions are acquired and we will set up the patient accordingly and then uh, we will take a, a treatment ve uh, verification KVCVCT uh, we will take the uh, KVCVCT at every level that is uh, this is the KVCVCT at the level of uh, head and thorax and we can see that uh, it is quite good match similarly at the level of uh, thorax and pelvis at the level of knee and at the level of uh, ankle area uh, so during the course of TBI we had monitored the patient and we had uh, we can uh, during uh, TBI we had administered some co-medications like dexamethasone, vanitrin and onlecetron we had uh, uh, showed a proper hydration and uh, mouthwash uh, during course of TBI we can see that um, most of the blood parameters are uh, to the essence uh, stable but absolute lymphocyte count uh, is uh, drastically reducing uh, further chemo part will be explained by one as explained the child is malleability condition in the form of a TBI along with the topocyte uh, this is the BMT compound sheet in our unit. This is for this child in listing all the scheduled uh, conditioning regimen and the other four connections for BMT in a time and day by surprise manner. Uh, concurrently, we uh, harvested, uh, we mobilized and harvested the census from his father and he received a dose of around 5.5 million CD medical census unmedically. And as a part of GVHD prophylaxis, he received cyclophosphamide, tracrolimus, and MMS. His neutrophils in rapid of day 13 and platelets on day 11. And he was discharged successfully on day plus 20. Today he is day plus 27 and he is doing well. There is no evidence of any GVHD as well. Now, invite Dr. Sarah to carry forward the discussion. So, um, coming to the review of literature. Uh, historically, uh, total body radiation was used without stem cell support for palliation of radiation sensitive diseases such as chronic lymphocytic leukemia and follicular lymphoma. Currently, TBI is primarily performed in the context of hematopoietic transplantation for its cytotoxic and immunologic effects. The patient's hematopoietic system is reconstituted after high dose chemotherapy with or without TBI from either the patient's own stem cell that is autologous or stem cell from donor that is allogenic. Uh, for TBI planning, there uh, there happens to be a wide health, 
variability between centers in regards to the technique use, total dose use, vaccination schemes use, dose rate, lung shielding and patient positioning use. And for uh, TBI, most centers still using two dimensional conventional technique with opposing, opposing beam that is AP anterior and posterior beam while shielding certain organisics. Uh, this techniques uh, of conventional uh, delivery delivers heterogeneous doses throughout the body while shielding blocks also block the bone marrow compartment. So new, newer highly conformer RT techniques offers better dose homogeneity while allowing more options for two spare OARs. Uh, this is one example uh, showing uh, delivery of conventional uh, uh, TBI patient. This is an instrument specific uh, uh, delivery system. They had made a patient uh, sit in a chair and patient uh, the dose was delivered in AP and then posterior position with blocks for, uh, for lungs and uh, kidney. Similarly, uh, another uh, institute uh, is using a uh, 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 lying down position with uh, blocks for uh, lungs and uh, kidney. So uh, then coming to VMAT based TBI, what is the dosimetric advantage? The study conducted by Springer et al. Uh, they had uh, conducted a study on total 7 patients and they con concluded that TBI with VMAT provides the benefit of satisfactory dose distribution within the PTV while selectively reducing doses to the lungs and if necessary in other organs. However, planning time is extensive. Another uh, dosimetric study is also uh, has highlighted the same. VMAT based technique increases the mean dose to the body uh, while decreasing uh, Doses to the lung. Uh, recently published forum trial, which was primarily uh, designed to uh, avoid total body radiation, but uh, it was a phase three non inferiority trial. They included patient less than or equal to 18 years uh, at the diagnosis and 4 to 21 years at the time of transplant and in complete remission. They had involved patients from 2013 to 2018, total 417 patients. They randomized to uh, 12 gray plus etoposide and chemo conditioning. <laughs> they had shown that uh, uh, at the uh, two year overall survival was uh, significantly higher in the TBI arm. Also, two years incidence of relapse and two year treatment modality was significantly better in uh, TBI arm. They had tried to find out any subgroup that could benefit with the chemo conditioning group, but uh, it could not be found. Uh, coming to uh, uh, specific to VMAT TBI. Survey was conducted uh, and uh, they had shown that uh, in the survey, uh, 12 grade 6 fraction was the commonest regimen that is being used uh, at most centers. And uh, most of the centers still are using conventional uh, TPA that is 24 out of 29. Only 5 of the uh, 29 centers were using uh, advanced techniques. And uh, TPA various, uh, there are two uh, guidelines regarding total body radiation. The INRAG guideline. Uh, uh, also, um, that was published in 2018. Uh, it uh, says that use of volumetric uh, IMRT or helical IMRT for TBI uh, will pro can provide a greater dose homogeneity and lower organ and dose, OR doses. Uh, recently published stop uh, guideline has also asked uh, has also um, stressed the uh, fact that we should uh, use highly conformal radiotherapy technique so that we can improve dose homogeneity and organs vary. Now I will call Dr. Ait sir to So thank you all. In conclusion, TBA is a very effective malleability treatment in conditioning regimens before adult transplant as I told before in high risk or relapsed acute leukemias. <laughs> and compared to chemotherapy uh, alone malleability regimens, TBA containing regimens have distinct advantages. Your delivery of TBI does not depend upon the vascular supply and is not influenced by the variability in drug absorption, metabolism, biodistribution, or clearance. RT can reach potential sanctuary sites such as the brain and the testis, and it also leads to eradication of chemotherapy resistant clones. TBI planning and delivery, however, makes an intricate teamwork involving radiation oncologists, medical physicists, radiotherapy technologists, and nursing staff. In this context, the widespread use of TBI is hampered by limited availability of infrastructure and human resources, and this is particularly true in low and middle income countries like ours. Conformal optimized TBI using BMAT platform has been found to be safe and feasible in our setting. 
We started the VMAT based malleability TBI program in our department in the spring of 2022, and we have planned 11 patients and treated nine patients to date. And uh, we could not execute TBI in two patients, one due to technical reason and one due to disease progression just before TBI. In future, attention needs to be focused on conformal total marrow radiation and total marrow and lymphoid radiation in this patient population to enhance normal tissue sparing, minimize the acute and late effects of TBI, and possibly attempt dose escalation in this cohort. Needless to say, there is a need for close collaboration between the pediatric oncologists, hematologists, and the radiation oncologists for appropriate patient selection, management, follow-up, and assessment of late effects, particularly in the context of a clinical trial. So with this, I'd like to conclude the session and thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, we can just take one quick question, if at all. I think it's just three o'clock. Dr. Aditya wanted to say something. Maybe you can voice your experience. So, thank you, Dr. Aditya. So, with uh, TBI, I mean, it has become easier for conducting the transplants. So, we have done seven till now, of which initially we used to do it outside. Now, ever since we have started, we have done five, and out of the seven, uh, five patients are doing well. So, we have some of the So, that's the response. So, uh, with the TBI, so with the forum trial, that did show a good uh, outcome. But now, the incidences of secondary malignancies post TBI have been more compared to the ones who received only chemotherapy. So solid malignancies, solid malignancies mostly and also brain tumors. So that has been found to be more and also infertility related side effects. Sorry sir. Of? Of the TBA. I think it's 750 Indian rupees so it's less than 10 dollars. So uh, with the transplant also this particular patient, so the total amount he spent in the transplant, that includes the cost of his uh, uh, his stay in the private ward, it was only, it was within 5 lakhs. So procedure which probably costs around 25 lakhs in the private setting, we have been able to do it at a significantly lower cost. So thank you again, we wind up the session. So good afternoon everybody. So radiotherapy department and resident don't feel shy. You are welcome to leave. We are going to start the ophthalmology uh, section. So we are going to discuss uh, a very challenging modality that is mucopolysaccharidosis and that tends to our patients as a blinding disorder and especially with glaucoma and pollen detoxification. These cases are also posted for surgery under general anesthesia. There is a lot of difficulty in intubation. So we have three sections presented today. The first part will be the management of glaucoma. That will be by Dr. Patrick and Mohan Dinkin, Assistant Professor at the Center. The second section will be the problem during general anesthesia intubation by Professor Renu Sina from Department of Anesthesia. And finally, we cover the difficult part that is a coronary rehabilitation. How to make the opaque cornea clear with cornea grafting and that will be by the head of unit 4 cornea and diploma services person number the trauma. So without any delay I would invite uh, Dr. Karthik to please start the presentation. Very good afternoon to everyone. We are going to talk about the ocular manifestation in case with mucopolysaccharidosis. A 8 year old male child presented with complaints of whitish appearance of foot eye since birth. It was slowly progressive, not associated with redness, watching or discharge. There was no history of birth, birth trauma or ocular infection in the neonatal period. It, uh, birth history was full term normal by delivery. There was history of delayed pride 
and a neonatal resuscitation. The patient had a, a family with a similar illness in the elder sister who died at six years of age. The patient had delayed developmental milestones, umbilical hernia repair at three years ago, and frequent respiratory, respiratory tract infection and stone. Patient visited our outpatient service one week back and started on maximum glaucoma medications. On examination, the patient had a short stature, poor facial features, large head, flat nasal bridge, macroglacia, hirsutism, and joint abnormalities and abnormal gait was noted. On abdominal palpation, hepatospinomegaly was present. X-ray showed a tapered and pointed metacarpals and deep malformed vertebral body with baking and lumbar hypothesis. And uh, ribs were widened anteriorly and tapered posteriorly and irregular shaped tarsal. On ocular examination, patient could follow object in both eyes. Baseline IP was 32 to 34 mm in right eye and 34 to 38 mm of mercury in left eye. On starting medication, IP came down to 12 in right eye and 16 in left eye. There was proptosis in both eyes. Uh, there was diffuse congenital congestion in both eyes and diffuse corneal haze from limbus to limbus. Like ground glass appearance. Fungus examination, um, the media was hazy, so this was hazily seen. It was around 0.6 cupping with pale disc in right eye, 0.8 cupping in, with pale disc in left eye, and rest of the details are not appreciated. Ultrasonography was anabolic. There was OLH cupping in both eyes and increased correlatal thickness. Ultrasound by the mesoscopy revealed a minimal narrowing crowding of the angle structures and the corneal thickness in right eye was 560 uh, microns and left eye was 530 microns. Uh, Echocardiography showed a thickened uh, survival apparatus, a mild mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation, normal bioventricular function. There was no hearing abnormality. In summary, as I showed that absence of RI sulfate is B activity. So, for differential diagnosis of patient, we have uh, corneal opacity and raised IP since birth. Uh, one is primary congenital glaucoma. There will be enlarged corneal diameter, stretch limbers, and half strain. Another sclerocornea will be complete opacification of cornea. The uh, limbus won't be seen. Another is due to birth trauma. Our patient didn't have any history of birth trauma. There will be corneal opacification and uh, break in Desmond's membrane. Another thing is Peter's anomaly. There will be central corneal opacity. And uh, can be associated with angular corneal adhesion. Another different D is endothelial dystrophy. It also has a similar ground glass appear, uh, corneal opacity, but difference is it doesn't have any systemic abnormality. Our patient had short stature, skeletal abnormalities, and uh, corneal clouding, raised uh, raised IOP and optic atrophy, and array uh, sulfate B enzyme was. Uh, activity was uh, defective. So, we diagnosed, made a final diagnosis of type 6 mucocorneal saccharidism with both type secondary glaucoma and corneal opacity. Uh, left eye trabeculotomy with trabeculotomy was done under general anesthesia. Uh, right eye anti-glaucoma medication was continued. On post day 1, right eye IOP was 14 mm mercury and left eye it was 16 mm mercury. Then patient was referred to corneal services for corneal rehabilitation. Mucopolis occurs is a rare entity, occurs in 3.24.5 in per 1 lakh livers. So, autosomal recessive disorder. There is defective catabolism of glycosomal glycans. These are the various types of mucopolis saccharidosis. Our patient has type 6 mucopolis saccharidosis, also called as Manatax Lamy syndrome. There is defective ARSB gene in chromosome 5q13 to 14. Uh, there is defective enzyme. There is accumulation of diabetes and sulfate and causes the pathology. These are the features seen in uh, MBSC. The patient, features which seen in our patient are corneal cloudy, glaucoma, optic nerve atrophy, short stature, joint deformity, short metacarpals, abnormal tarsal bones, abnormal ribs spine, and other features were macrocephaly, broad nasal bridge, and umbilical hernia, and epitope spin of megaly. The corneal cloudy occurs due to accumulation of glycosomal glycans and gives a typical ground glass corneal pipe uh, appearance opacification. It affects the whole cornea from limbus to limbus and diffuse and it's slowly progressive. 
glaucoma is seen in 2.1 to 12.5 percent of the patients. It is due to abnormal glycosamine glycan accumulation in the trabecular mesure. It changes in it changes the structure of trabecular mesure and alteration proliferation of the TM cells. So it slows the aqueous humor outflow and causes the open angle glaucoma or accumulation in the peripheral cornea or iris or ciliar body can cause crowding of the anterior chamber angle and cause angle closure glaucoma. It can also accumulate in the sclera, alter the tensile and viscoelastic behavior of sclera and cause glaucoma. It also has an important role in response of laminar fibrillation to pressure. Uh, it can also, uh, glycosaminal glycans can also accumulate in the RPE and cause arterial attenuation or poor retinal atrophy. It can cause thickening of the dura and sclera, cause optic disc swelling and optic atrophy. Because of the uh, raised ICT, it can also compress the posterior optic nerve and cause uh, optic atrophy, which can be mistaken as glaucomatous optic atrophy. So, it is called as posterior glaucoma. So, what difficulties we have in diagnosing glaucoma? One is the child is very uncooperative, and there is difficulty in doing examination under anesthesia due to systemic issues. There will be fallacious IUP reading due to corneal classifications. An optic assessment may require ultrasonography and uh, mission field can't be done due to the intellectual impairment of the patient. And due to difficult conioscopy, we might need ultrasound biomanscopy or ASOCT to see the angle details. To conclude, IFP recorded can be falsely high and non glaucomatous optic neuropathy is seen in up 50% of the patient. So, we should avoid our diagnosis of the glaucoma and unnecessary surgical inter intervention. Timely intervention by corneal specialist may be needed to improve the visual acuity. Systemic therapies have increased the life expectancy of patients with mucopolysaccharides. <coughs> the ophthalmologists have an important role as a part of multidisciplinary management of this patient whose visual problems may be additional to multiple other physical and intellectual impairment. Thank you. Now, Dr. Uh, Professor Renu will be talking about anesthesia related complications. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone. So, uh, surgery is difficult and anesthesia is also difficult in these patients. So, I will be talking about anesthesia management particularly for mucopolysaccharidosis type 6. They need anesthesia for various procedures even for the investigations. And in RP center we do quite a lot of mucopolysaccharidosis uh, for eye surgeries. So this patient was 8 year old 20 kg type 6 which is called Merolami syndrome and I was hearing it for the first time as they are very rare 1% in all form of mucopolysaccharidosis. So one younger faculty called me a day before that there is some patient of mucopolysaccharidosis and he was not that much confident so he called me about uh, this case. So we had a history that he was operated for umbilical hernia in 2019. We saw the previous discharge somebody and in that somebody there was no um, Nothing was there for anesthesia management, so we were again on stage zero that what was happened in the last anesthesia exposure. So airway management in mucopolysaccharidosis is difficult and as patients grow old, there is progression of difficulty in intubation much more than what it was before. And there is difficult mass ventilation intubation and sometimes failed intubation. We also published some case reports of Hurler syndrome in which the patient died two days after the surgery because of the cardiac problem. And another case was uh, successfully managed for adenotonsillectomy. So mucopolysaccharidosis type 6, we read about what, what is there in different from other mucopolysaccharidosis. Like other mucopolysaccharidosis, they have all the features which Kartikeyan told. And the risk factor depend upon the type of mucopolysaccharidosis, age, previous anesthetic exposure and depending upon the therapy, whether, whether they are getting enzyme replacement or some other stem cell transplant, then the uh, risk factor will be different. So for anesthetist, it is difficult airway with cardiac disease, restrictive lung disease, they may have obstructive sleep apnea and they may have sensory neural deafness, so you can't communicate much. And difficult airway, as Kartikeyan told, all features were there in this patient. So the genetic evaluation was done and it was diagnosed type 6, pediatric cardiology was done, echo was done, echo was mostly normal with normal biventricular function, only the mitral valve was thickened. 
then ent consultation was done there was macroglossia but they could not do other things because of the patient was uncooperative and hdu bed was arranged for the patient so on airway examination patient was having large tongue mmp4 high arc palate restrictive neck movements scoliosis and difficult iv access so we prepared as difficult iv nebulization difficult cart airway cart experienced anesthesiologist and team was there and short acting drugs were used and icu was arranged monitoring we did we already do uh, all the monitoring in otherwise patients also in this we have entropy and bis and then this year was chosen largely regional anesthesia and if needed opioids extubation was planned as awake extubation and preparation for reintubation so uh, this is the uh, patient it is a short video in which you can see the nebulization with 4% lignocaine was done and amla was put on both the hand to have the iv which was done under awake so the patient was having difficult iv so when we was used to fit the iv line patient did not have any pain this is to show that the abdomen was so distended and the patient was breathing with mouth open and it was told to the patient he was 8 year and for us it was cooperative enough to listen that he has to breathe through mouth after the extubation as patient was having short neck so the uh, position was made initially 100% oxygen was uh given so that the uh, we will have some time for airway manipulation and then it was induced with sevoflurane these patients have obstructed airway so only sevoflurane will not help and along with that we gave some amount of propofol we were able to ventilate with two hand techniques and after that once the patient achieved good anesthesia depth and at that point of time we used uh, second generation uh, supraglottic device you see that it is little bit difficult to put the supraglottic device and after that once it was inflated and connected to the uh, circuit there was no etco2 was coming and we were not able to ventilate so after that the airway was changed to uh, ambu lma and after this we were able to ventilate uh, but it was not that good so we decided to do the fiber optic to know about the uh, glottic aperture because in these patient there is accumulation of glycosylamine glycan and there is narrow Uh, glottic opening so we found that it is very narrow and only four size tube can be uh, put in in a 8 year old child so jointly we decided to change it to the second generation supraglottic device so that we can use a higher airway pressure during the ventilation as patient abdomen is too big and the lungs are too uh, too short so with this we were able to have good etco2 along with that we did the some ventilatory changes and with that we were able to ventilate and after that mus neuromuscular relaxant was given and desflurane was used for the shorter procedure entropy was put to have the depth of anesthesia monitoring and uh, peripheral block was given with 2 ml of 0.25% rupivacaine to avoid the opioid use and you can see the 29 air pressure was there uh, for this uh, patient to have the etco2 of around 40 to 50 which is quite high but these patients already had this it is so after that after the end of the surgery once the patient was having spontaneous ventilation the it is co2 was quite high at the range of 70 71 and gradually it decreases to 50 and saturation was maintained and heart rate was okay so this child was removal of lma was done in a awake uh, position and then patient was given oxygen by face mask but he was having obstructed airway so nasopharyngeal airway was put in through the nose as the patient was not having adenoid hypertrophy and with that etco2 was ranging from 30 to 60 in between and gradually it came down and patient became away and was shifted to recovery room and we were quite tired though the surgery was half an hour but the anesthesia was much more so head end was elevated and you can see the patient is still sleeping in the recovery room and after 2 hours patient was awake and we gave something to uh drink and we we also drank at that point of time <laughs> so uh, my my younger faculty said that ma'am koi confidence nahi aaya and i said mera confidence khatam ho gaya so this was the anesthesia chart you can see that it is whole field about the anesthesia management so thank you very much Thank you, Renu. I think Renu must be having the uh, experience of giving. Uh,
All the colors that we have done are pretty good. The colors you don't want to be for panic sentences. You have different varieties. So, Konya may or may not be involved. So, some of the cases when the Konya is not involved is cloud manipulation, that the visual activity of say 6, 6 by 60 or 6 by 36, I think you are able to see some chart. You don't do anything, but sometimes it's really cloudy and then you have to do either a partial thickness procedure or have to do a full thickness procedure. So, the partial thickness procedure that you do. In these cases, is deep anterior lamella keratoplasty. And the full thickness procedure that we do in these cases is uh, is uh, penetrating keratoplasty. So, so uh, I would just like to show you that from RP Center for the first time we said and we advocated that deep anterior lamella keratoplasty is okay to do. In these cases, because endothelium doesn't get involved. So, penetrating keratoplasty or full thickness keratoplasty has its own problems. Like it has, you can have expulsive hemorrhage, you can have cataract, you can have glaucoma. But when you do a partial thickness procedure, then these problems are not there. 
so this is how the cornea would look like in uh, in some of these cases and for these cases even if say the visual is 660 we will not do anything but if it is less we would do it the corneal thickness which shows which is shown in the pachymetry maps in these cases is always increased this has already been discussed by dr kartike once you have come to the diagnosis important thing to realize is that cornea has six layers so the innermost layer which is the corneal endothelium in these cases is generally normal and not not affected that much which has been shown in the various studies and earlier whatever is published now this was only five patients and published full thickness keratoplasty so whatever case reports that were published and these are just two to one two two cases and all of them are undergone penetrating keratoplasty that means full thickness keratoplasty so what we are now advocating is that we just do deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty so that this red layer or endothelium is the patient's own endothelium so we are actually not entering the eye it is a closed group procedure there is no risk of hemorrhage cataract glaucoma or even endothelial graft rejection so this movie won the uh, best of show award at the american academy of ophthalmology and this is her so what we do in this case is do a partial thickness trifurcation then inject a air bubble and then do a layer by layer dissection so once you do this layer by layer dissection Uh, in, the, in the neck, we, we make a small neck in the overlying stromal layers, and we dissect above the displacement plane. So it's a very thin layer of about 10 microns over which we are working, and we have not entered the eye because that layer is there between the eye. That means the pupil and the iris and the outside. So we are still extraocular. We have not penetrated the uh, the eye at all, and this thin film of layer, which is about only 10 microns, is still there. now this is a full thickness donor cornea which is taken from which this desmet membrane and endothelium is removed and then subsequently this is uh, sutured with tensile monofilament and nylon sutures and this is just to show a bilateral case of hernia's right eye left eye the surgery was done which is extraocular now this is 19 years follow up the best corrected visual acuity is almost 6 by 9 and we have not entered the eye at all i mean uh, so there are no problems and the patient uh, is still you know continuing now we have off late acquired this intraocular microscope so the things have become a lot more uh, simpler in the sense that you can see this desmets layer which is present or which is absent and whether you have perforated or not and you just do this uh, replacement of the anterior stromal layers now if you send this for histopathology then you'll see that the bowman's membrane is atrophic keratocytes are ballooned out the granular deposits are there in the keratocyte in the cellular tissue and if you do a histopath then colloidal iron with the colloidal iron it will show that there are there is nps staining which is expected in these cases so yet another case to show the post operative outcome which was done more recently so and, and this is just to show the anterior segment ocp the thickness is quite normal only this layer which you see is actually the patient's own layer but rest all the layers as you can see this graft host junction here are from the donor cornea and because you're not you are not transplanting the endothelium chances of rejection are also very less and and this does well uh, for these patients of course uh, uh, this we are specifically talking about mps6 which was our case uh, which was here and uh, again in these cases this patient is awaiting a corneal transplantation procedure now uh, this is uh, the quantification of changes in corneal clouding over patients with mucopolysaccharidosis again in just total five cases and laronidase is one thing which can be given uh, by intravenous infusion in these cases and this causes catabol uh, catabolism of the glycosamine glycans but i don't think it is available in our country and this was a paradigm shift in the corneal surgery for mucopolysaccharidosis and after we published an eyes of hernia syndrome with uh, with deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty i think the entire world has shifted to dal from penetrating keratoplasty subsequently these studies are also available for the same so i think uh, management of mps requires a multidisciplinary approach has been as has been highlighted and uh, i think that is why the tanuj chose to present this case and in ours we did not have to involve in everybody but uh, depending upon where the uh, where the pathology is one has to involve everybody uh, to manage these cases thank you very much for your time